being in theology, I said, oh, goodness, I've been one of these for a long time. I just didn't know it. Here's how, it's, here's how it was sealed, though. One year at Southern, this was in 1984. If you're familiar with broader history, you realize that in the 1980s, Southern Baptist Convention was in the throes of controversy. There was the modernist, uh, or the liberals, and the, the, the fundamentalist. And uh, the very first convocation, the president of the seminary delivered in the fall of 1984, President Roy Honeycutt delivered what has come to be known in Southern Baptist history as the Holy War Convocation. And that's where he declared holy war and called the troops to bear arms against the fundamentalist in the Southern Baptist Convention who wished to take over their church, not realizing that it had been them that had taken over the church. They then began recruiting to go next year to the Southern Baptist Convention to be sure that Charles Stanley of Atlanta was not elected as president because that would be the demise, the ruin of the Southern Baptist Convention as they knew it. Well, it, they didn't accomplish that, but nevertheless, that helped me realize, what am I doing here? Not only that, but I was only required in the curriculum to take one year of Hebrew or uh, one year of Greek and one semester of Hebrew. Now, all of you already know enough to know that only makes you dangerous. Highly dangerous. Well, I knew enough time to know that's not sufficient. And then, uh, through a series of God's wonderful providences, I learned of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary, a Southern Baptist school, but not one of the six supported by the denomination, had been started by a group of professors out of another Southern Baptist seminary because of their concern. It was supported by big steeple churches like First Baptist Atlanta and Bellevue Baptist Church and First Baptist Dallas and on and on. And they were all guns behind it. That school has never once had a day of debt. They have been debt free with magnificent facilities in three different locations to the present day. And uh, they now house Jay Adams collection and are the, the church for the um, American uh, Council of Biblical Counseling. They offer that Jay Adams Neuthetic Counseling degree. Uh, how they did that, I'm not quite sure. But that's what Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary is. I go down after one year and I find myself at home, high regard for the scriptures, high regard for preaching and the languages. And it was in the course of my study of Greek. This is no joking, guys. This is how God sealed the deal with me on the doctrines of grace and particularly particular or limited atonement. My Greek professor in, in intermediate Greek one day he said, okay, guys, it's time for your first paper. Come by, out of the box, take a piece of paper. Whatever that verse is, that's yours to do your, your exegetical paper on. I picked Romans 8, 28 and following, and I had to deal with the golden chain. So I got through that, and I thought, okay, yeah, God's done this. All this is, this is, this is all here, but... That doesn't rule out the tunnel of time theory, that he looked down and saw who would believe, and then he picked them. So, next semester comes. Okay, guys, it's time. The box goes out. I put my hand in. I'm not, this is no joking. And not everyone's getting the same piece of paper, okay? I picked Romans 9, Esau and Jacob. That took care of my earlier thoughts. Third semester, it's time, Ephesians 1. I was done for. I was a, I was, I was a, I was a, I was a Calvinist. At the same time in my New Testament studies, I kept running across in the book of Acts and elsewhere these elders. We didn't have elders in our Southern Baptist churches. We had pastors and deacons. And so here are these elders and there seems to be more than one elder always in focus. And I would ask questions. They didn't have answers. 
And I went one day, Dr. Tom Nettles was on the faculty there. He later would go to, to uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School after he, was, uh, he graduated with us in 1988. Uh, you know how faculties graduate. They either die or uh, they get fired, and he graduated with us. Still alive and well. Went to TED's for a period, and then when Al Mohler came as president at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he called his buddy Tom Nettles down to be the church historian and to help him with that early phase of reforming Southern Seminary. Uh, Dr. Nettles and some others had started the Founders Movement in the Southern Baptist Convention. I would go over to the Founders Conference at a Presbyterian college, Rhodes College, and I would buy books off the book table. Now, the thing you have to know about Calvinistic Baptist is there aren't many books available from Calvinistic Baptist. So they sell you Presbyterian books to get the Calvinism, right? The problem with that for me was I read the books. And I pick up a set of James Henley Thornwell. See, this is a beautiful segue from my life into this life that I'm about to talk about. James Henley Thornwell. And I was reading volume one on the covenant of works and covenant of grace, and then I thought, you know, Volume 4 is about ecclesiology. So I would popped over and I start reading on ecclesiology and I get there and I said, whoa, this is, this is it. This is what I believe. This is what the Bible teaches that none of my professors could tell me what it is. What's it called? What is it? So I flip over to the dust jacket and I see that he's a dead Presbyterian. You all need to understand, I didn't know any dead Presbyterians. I didn't know any living Presbyterians. I only knew this, Presbyterians don't believe the Bible. Well, that was true. There, were some, there are some, there are many who don't. So I was in a conundrum. I don't have time for the rest of the story of how God fixed that and how providentially he guided and directed and upheld and brought it all to place to where I was engaged by good, godly Presbyterian men, and uh, that's how I became a Presbyterian and Reformed, was in a Baptist seminary. Just when people say, so how did you come to this? The bottom line was reading my Bible. And I realize that sounds a bit arrogant to some people, but it's the truth. It was just reading the Scriptures. And uh, I'm thankful that the Lord gave them to me. Well, I mentioned James Henley Thornwell. I began with Thornwell because that's where I began with, was with Thornwell. But I also began with Thornwell because he is, uh, he is the, he's the, uh, he's the notable Southern theologian. He and Robert Louis Dabney. And they represent two different schools. But I'm just, I'm going to thumb you through this real quick. Just a little quick history, because I can't talk about all the Southerners like I pretty much touched on with the course that Professor Kamen goes in. I'm just going to focus on three Southern Presbyterians today. One's Thornwell. One is John L. Gerardo. Uh, if you're French, it's Gerardo, but it's anglicized. It's Gerardo. And uh, then the other is Robert Louis Dabney. Gerardo and Thornwell both at the Columbia Theological Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina at the time. You know it now as I call the New Columbia at Decatur, Georgia. But Dabney then was at Union Seminary in Richmond at the time. It was in Hamden, Sydney, Virginia. Not the Union up, the Union of the New School Presbyterians up in New York State, but the Union of Virginia. But I want to t just run you through this to show you some pictures so you kind of have some, some faces to think about. And, but this is a Bible. This is one of the oldest uh, 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 figures as far as establishing churches in the southern United States, Archibald Stobo. Now, that's not his picture, obviously. But that's a picture of his Bible, which is in the uh, uh, his South Carolina Historical Society uh, building in in Charleston. Stobo established the first presbytery of Presbyterians in the South, established at least as early as 1722. One of the earliest churches in the U.S. Presbyterian-wise is down on Ed uh, Edisto Island, 
1689 is the origination date for that congregation. But this is Stobo's Bible. It's just a picture to, to commemorate him because he deserves it. One of the leading figures was C.C. Jones. C.C. Jones was from Georgia. He was known as the Apostle to the Negro Slaves. Did a remarkable job, was a Princeton graduate, studied under uh, Hodge, Archibald Alexander, and Samuel Miller. No time for him. He did write a marvelous book on, called The Church of God. It's really a, an ecclesiology of sorts but is mainly known for his ministry to the slaves. This is the old church down there that he grew up in, the Midway Congregational Church. That Midway Congregational Church was short-lived because of its location, but during a period of about 90 years, that church produced over 30 ministers of the gospel, and most of them were Presbyterians. It was a remarkable period of God's mercy and grace working in a congregation out in the middle of nowhere. It's still in the middle of nowhere. When you go down there, you're like, goodness, there's nothing out here. Well, there was nothing out there then. It was cotton fields and this one church. Uh, John Bailey Adger, another significant figure, missionary. He's from South Carolina, missionary to Armenia, translated a number of works into the Armenian language of the time. And then, due to health, had to come back and established a, a work among the slaves and free blacks of Charleston. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow, uh, his ministry that John Gerardo picked up and the remarkable uh, influence on the, on the whole southern culture down there. Uh, another fantastic figure in the south is John Layton Wilson, also a missionary to, uh, to Congo. He was one of the first missionaries to what was called then Black Africa. Um, some fascinating stories there. Came back and was the secretary of mission for the whole Presbyterian Church of the United States uh, of America and then for the Southern Presbyterian Church after 1861 when the war came. A large figure. In fact, Robert Louis Dabney said in 1872 in the Southern Presbyterian Church, no man welded more influence and power than John Layton Wilson. And you think about that. There were some remarkable figures in the Southern Church that I'll talk about today and tomorrow, and yet here's this man who was basically a missionary and a missionary statesman, and yet he was recognized as, as the, probably the leading voice and figure in that era. Here's one of the leading pastors of the time, Thomas Smythe, Second Presbyterian Church. Ron, you remember us walking up to Second Presbyterian Church. And Smythe was a longtime pastor, 1834 to 73. Um, he was quite a bibliophile. Just prior to the war between the states, he gave over 15,000 volumes out of his personal library. How many volumes do you all have? Yeah, he gave 15 out of his library. Gerardo said after the war, 1865 or so, when he first came back to Charleston from being out of Charleston during the war, came back and he was invited to the Smythe home on King Street, and he was going to, he thought, he was looking forward to it, but he was going to be saddened because he knew Pastor Smythe had given all those volumes to the seminary, in 1860-61, and he said, I, I, I knew I'd be sad when I saw the empty bookshelves. Now think about this. The war had come in the interim. And he said then, and, but then as I went to the second floor of his home, my heart rejoiced to see all those shelves full once again. Now guys, you're thinking, how would, could he afford so many books? He married well. Just a note, he married very well. He married John Bailey Adger's sister. John Bailey Adger and his sister and brother and others, their father was James Adger, who in, 19, in 18, uh, the census of 1850 was the fourth wealthiest man in the United States. He was a shipping magnet. He was a mercantile, into mercantile everything, a wealthy family, but a godly family. All the children grew up believing, believing, 
serving the church, the remarkable story of this Irish immigrant that came to the States and made well and his children trusted Christ and, and were leaders in, in the Presbyterian church. Here's the venerable George Howe. Over 50 years he, he taught at Columbia Theological Seminary. He was the Semitic linguist. He was the church historian. He was the librarian. He was a, a true Renaissance man. He could do it all. And, uh, and so, don't have time for any more of Howe, but a remarkable figure. And then to Thornwell. That, that is a, that's a, actually a, a stamp of Thornwell uh, and his figure in 1851. Uh, that's quite a picture. Great hairdo. Just some church buildings I throw in. That's First Presbyterian Church in Columbia. B.M. Palmer was pastor when that was built. He went to New Orleans shortly after that and pastored for 40 plus years. We'll talk more about him tomorrow. And they built a building almost identical to that, which no longer stands. That's still, of course, that's a recent picture I took there. That was where the seminary was housed in what's called the Robert Mills House for uh, 100 years, 1831 until 1828. And uh, here's a place where Thornwell preached on the campus of the University of South Carolina. That was the Rutledge Chapel. That was, that was where he lectured his uh, philosophy lectures, his ethics lectures, and he would preach chapel every day at what was then South Carolina College. Uh, we go in there every time I'm down there and talk about some of these things. That's where he delivered the, the discourses on truth. His, uh, his, his uh, what were called then moral philosophy lectures. We know it now as more ethics, but uh, moral philosophy lectures drawn from Philippians 4.8, whatever is pure, what is true, noble, etc. He delivered in this chapel here. Sir William Hamilton wrote him a letter after its publication. He had received a copy from the publisher. He wrote Thornwell a letter back in Columbia commending him on this, this excellent treatise. William Hamilton, of course, the, the leading philosopher of the day in the 19th century. And that shows you how, how well held and how highly recognizable James Henley Thornwell's name was, not just in the South, not just in the U.S., but internationally as well. Here's some more pictures of Thornwell and his tombstone in the Elmwood Cemetery. Here's my man, Jane, uh, John L. Gerardo. He was also a South Carolinian, and uh, you just got to love the sideburns, don't you? You know? He was French Huguenot descent. We'll talk more about him. Here are some of the church buildings he preached in in Charleston before his time as an academic at the, at the Columbia Seminary. He pastored. He began in this building to your left there. That was a little mission building that was housing would seat about 500, not comfortably, not certainly with us today, We'd larger than they would have been, but uh, started with 36 folks. They've soon had the walls bulging, and they had to build a new building, and they built this, and they let the slaves and the free blacks name it, and they named their church Zion. Now, contemplate that. I always am just marveled. I sometimes choke up thinking, what, what do you want to name our church? And they named it Zion. This is where God dwells with his people. And here they are, many of them slaves, and they had that appreciation. When we gather to worship our God, all this, that transcends all of this, all that's going on in this world, Zion. That building was demolished in 1859, sadly, with nothing saved from it. Not a pulpit, nothing I, I've been able to find. Here's another building he preached after the war, and this one primarily on Glebe Street. We still get to go there. That, happened, that picture was taken without my knowledge. That's me standing right there talking to my dear friend Hezekiah Kithcart, a member of that congregation. It's a AME congregation, African Methodist Episcopal congregation that inhabits that building now. 
And then another Southern theologian that I'll just mention in glancing, we don't have time, is Thomas Peck. He was a student of Thornwell's, went on to be Dabney's handpicked successor at Union Seminary. When Dabney left the church history post and moved to systematic theology, and then when Dabney was leaving to go be the, one of the founding faculty members at the University of Texas in Austin, he was the philosopher down there for that founding faculty uh, at University of Texas. And he wanted Peck to be his successor then as well as the systematic theologian. Remarkable figure as well. I'll mention him to you. And then, of course, I mentioned Dabney. There he is in three different periods of his life. That gives us all hope. God doesn't look on the outside. And there's a picture of Dabney, who is here with the founding faculty members of the University of Texas in Austin. That would have been in about 1882. Uh, so uh, kind of give you an idea of these men. We'll be talking about what they look like. Okay. That was fast and furious. But uh, we'll, we'll start with that. Let me talk about Thornwell. Thornwell was reared in a home by a, a dear godly mother who was of Welsh extract. She was a Calvinistic Baptist. His father died when he was an infant. Two wealthy planters, as they were called, wealthy men, one was uh, a planter, but also an attorney. One was a planter and uh, a military figure. And they took up the, the cause of Mrs. Thornwell and her children, but particularly her oldest son, James, and determined that he was rather precocious and that they would see to it that he was educated through college. And so they took care of all of his, all of his cost, all of his needs, and he went straight through to the college in Columbia. He graduated. Upon his graduation, they offered him a teaching position. That didn't happen very often. And uh, he, he didn't. He went back home. He taught like many did at that time. He taught in the local schools as an as a instructor. And they then called back, and you sure, we have a position, and he took it. In there somewhere, God saved him. He fell upon a, a book in a bookstore called the Westminster Confession of Faith. He, he devoured it one night. He read it, he says, and all the scripture proofs. And by the time the morning sun broke, he says, I was a believer in Jesus Christ and a, and a holder to the doctrines herein contained. He taught at the college. He uh, would then later go to Andover and to Harvard to study, and he found them too liberal. He didn't find them able to instruct him any further than he'd already been instructed. So he returned home, finished up some theological studies at the seminary in Columbia, was licensed, and then subsequently ordained, and was the minister to two different churches, country churches up in the north east quarter of the state of South Carolina. Back to the seminary once again as professor of moral philosophy. He left for a time to be pastor of that Glebe Street building that I was standing in front of. Six months that lasted and they called back <clears throat> and said, you're needed. We need you to be the president this time. The college was at low ebb. He came back and he's attributed by haters and likers alike today as having virtually saved the college from extinction. It became known as the Presbyterian College to the dismay of a number of people. But because of that, he was wise enough to say, okay, we need to start having our Baptist and Methodist brethren come preach in chapel to, because we're having some people not send their kids here. They need to be here. So, then the seminary wooed him and said, you need to be here teaching theology. And so for the last five years of his life, he was the, what they call then, professor of didactic and polemics at the Columbia Seminary. 
Now, let me just give you a few of his distinctives since I've given you a bit of his background. He was a, a ardent uh, holder to Ure Dueno Presbyterianism, just divine right Presbyterian. He believed the Bible taught it. This was not something that was, was revealed to us uh, in the light of nature. This was not something that we could just, uh, this fits our culture best. He believed the Bible taught it, that there is a representative form of governance whereby congregations are ruled and shepherded by a plurality of elders, and those churches are, in, are connected organically. There's not independent autonomous churches, and so they, they function together as a whole, and thus they represent to the world the, the, the church not as a, as a sect, but as, a, as the body of Christ. And, uh, and he argued this uh, often, and he argued it stoutly. One of the things that this produces in Thornwell is, uh, is the firm conviction that God gave the church her marching orders. She was to, under Christ's banner, under his authority, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Trinity, and teaching people all that he's commanded. And that was their mission, plain and simple. She was not to weld the sword. She was not a legislative body. The sword in national legislating was to the civil magistrate solely. Uh, and, uh, and so he stood on that ground. Now back to the whole governing thing. Here was his rationale. He saw it in the scriptures. But he also had another rationale from, from salvation. Soteriologically, he believed this. He said, look, if God so loved a people that he set his, his love on them from eternity past, and he then sent his son to live and die and to uh, be raised for them, and even now sit in session with him, interceding for his people continually. What sense would it make that he leaves them on this earth to try to figure it out for themselves? That is, how to live together in the church of the living God, the bride of Christ, the household of faith. If God did all that, if he took care of all the details from eternity right up through them being saved, justified, adopted, why would anybody think, why would any rational man think that God would then just leave them on their own to figure it out? He said, no, of course, the scriptures tell us then how we're to live together and how we're to govern and be governed. And so from the scriptures and from his deductions from his soteriology, he came to that position as well. Another distinctive flowing from his, from his uh, uh, commitment, and by the way, uh, I'll mention this in a moment, I'll mention now, uh, Thornwell was thoroughly biblical and theological. Uh, if, if you care to read a piece I wrote, uh, I was very privileged to be asked a few years back uh, on the 70, I think, 70, yes, 75th birthday of old Palmer Robertson. You, you will all be familiar with Dr. Robertson and his Christ of the Covenants and Christ of the Prophets and his uh, flow of the Psalms and numerous other books. I was asked to write for his Feshrift. And that's, uh, that was a great privilege. I mean, I didn't even have to pray about that. I just said yes. And uh, so then the idea was uh, Dr. Robertson has a great love for the Southern Presbyterians, and he would like for you to write something along those lines. So I said, sure. So my friend Peter Wallace, some years earlier, had written for the Westminster Theological Journal an article about the biblical theology of the Princeton men that was a precursor to Gerhardus Voss. That the things Voss was doing with the consecutive bereavement makings and such. 
you can find that in some seminal form at least in Old Princeton in the 19th century. He published that in the Westminster Theological Journal. I thought, wow, I can do the same. I know these Southerners. They had the same predisposition that those Princetonians did toward biblical theology of the Voss sort, not to be anachronistic. And so I'm going to do that for Dr. Robertson, and that's what I did. So if you care to read that, you'll pick up on some of these themes and Thornwell was thoroughly in the middle, uh, uh, certainly in the middle of this flow of looking at the scripture from a biblical theological perspective, as well as systematically. He saw the biblical theology bringing us to the ability to make a summary statement of our theology. One of the things that he saw in the scriptures was what has come to be called the spiritual spirituality of the church or the spiritual doctrine of the church. Uh, you know, the older theologians, Andrew Melville and others, uh, Robert Bruce and others, the Scotsman, referred to it simply as the spiritual independence of the church, the independence of the church from state. One has a spiritual calling, one has a, a civil calling. One to well the sword, one to preach the gospel, the sword of the Lord. And so... Uh, Thornwell picked up on those emphases from the earlier theologians and developed this. And uh, here's, a, here's a, a, a statement that epitomizes that. The power of the church is exclusively spiritual. That of the state includes the exercise of force. The constitution of the church is a divine revelation. The constitution of state must be determined by human reason in the course of providential events. The church has no right to construct or modify government for the state, and the state has no right to frame a creed or polity for the church. They are as planets moving in different orbits, and unless each is confined to its own track, the consequences may be as disastrous in the moral world as collision of a different spheres in the world of matter. That's his statement in summary of what he means by the spiritual nature of the church, that we have a a specific calling in life. He applied this to the corporate work of the church so as to disabuse churches from entering into political rhetoric, legislative peddling, and social trend setting, or more often social trend following what the church tends to do. In other words, where it's perfectly fine for individual Christians to be involved in civil politics, laboring for legislature that's morally good for society, and active in the social sphere of the world in which they live, it's not the place of the pulpit. And he would have drawn a course there from our own Westminster Confession, chapter 23, paragraph 2, makes these same remarks, that while it's not the place of the church corporately to do this, for individuals, it's their place as Christians to go out and to live in the world as salt and light in this world. The church corporate possesses ministerial and declarative powers only that are aimed at gathering the elect through evangelism and edifying the gathered saints through the teaching and preaching ministry of the church. Uh, that's the twofold purpose of the church. The last three emphases of Thornwell, I'll bring your attention, are ecclesiology related. Um, well, the first is, is at least... He did a considerable amount of work on the office of elder. This is where he and Charles Hodge came to uh, scrub foreheads a few times. Um, and it's one of those things that uh, you have to be careful with. It's easy to overstate and to understate. I'm just going to put it simply. Thornwell came to the point, seeing in Scripture, that the office of elder as Qual as the qualifications are given, uh, incorporate both the teaching and the ruling functions. In other words, both the pastor and the elder have the same qualifications. They're distinguished from the deacon in that apt to teach qualification. The deacon is a minister, as Thornwell put it, we should never confuse uh, the keys and the purse. 
keys of the kingdom, the exercise of the keys of the kingdom by the elders of the church and the purse of the church, the phys physical, temporal matters. And he says, when we do confuse the keys and the purse, we'll inevitably harm the ministry of the church. And uh, I'll flesh this out some tomorrow when I get into the diaconal ministry emphasis that John Gerardo drafted out of Thornwell's writings and elaborated on. Supremacy of scripture over reason and tradition. He addresses the Romish issues a lot. What's the true church? What is valid baptism? What's the nature of scripture? An excellent little article of introduction if, you, uh, if you'll look for it. I know you all subscribe, as I understand, to the Confessional Presbyterian. And it's... Uh, yeah, I see one displayed back there last year's uh, uh, edition. Uh, I just uh, uh, did a peer review for uh, one that was submitted. It was one that uh, we didn't have to send out of house. And by the way, we'd love to have some of you gentlemen uh, submit. We can't afford to pay you anything for it, but uh, we have about 500 subscribers to, to our, little, our little rag that's published out of Dallas, Texas. We've been doing this since 2004, I think. We're in our 15th year now. And uh, we have an excellent piece coming on Thornwell and Scripture that helps introduce him and to show uh, how important it is to have a good understanding of Scripture and the nature and authority of Scripture. Uh, I'm sure you all would agree with me, being in academics and 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 converse with the church and things going on in the church and you see things I see things in papers and magazines uh, and so much of what I see people doing and saying you can, you can realize that what's behind that is either a low or no view of scripture and I'm talking about people who consider themselves to be quote evangelicals and I'll just go ahead and use a good term even among Protestants. And I'm not talking about those that we've already marked out as liberals, mainliners. I'm talking about people that think themselves to be pretty much mainstream, orthodox, confessional Protestants. And you hear them saying things and see their churches doing things that it's obvious that there's something going wrong with their understanding of the nature, authority of Scripture. This is a good little piece that's coming in the journal this time. I, that's all I can say on that. He was thoroughly, though, given to Calvin and to the Scottish reformers and their high view of Scripture. And then finally, I am going to mention that he was thoroughly Calvinian. At the end of the first book of his collected writings, you'll find a, uh, how many pages? I think I have it here. Uh, 50, 50. Uh, uh, 55 pages of outline and analysis of Calvin's Institutes. Here's the thing that distinguished Columbia Theological Seminary from Union in Virginia and Princeton. You all already know this. Union or Princeton, m the most notable of the two, uh, Hodge, up until the time he finally was persuaded to publish his notes on theology, uh, used Turretin. So did Dabney. But in Columbia, they used Calvin. And when you get into some of these differences that they had, sometimes they're intramural differences, but it's a difference between Calvin and Turretin. And you can almost count on it when it comes out. For instance, I'll jump to Gerardo. Something that Thornwell began, Gerardo picked up on and developed more fully, the doctrine of adoption. Now, you all are familiar with the, our tradition, Westminster Confession, and it has a distinct chapter heading on adoption. Turretin, Hodge followed Turretin, Dabney followed Turretin, largely it's we were talking about justification, and one of the aspects of just our justification is adoption. Um, I'll read you a Dabney quote in a moment on that. Well, 
Thornwell said no. While they're concurrent in redemptive history, God declares us just, and distinct from that, he declares us adopted as sons. There are two declarative acts. There are two forensic acts that take place, and they're distinct. One is judicial. God declares us as the judge of the world, not guilty. The other is familial. As the father, he adopts us into his family. That's a distinction that you'll see. That's the reason I say it's intramural, but Calvin makes the familial argument. Turretin subsumes adoption under justification. And so we'll say more about that. Okay, that's all I can do on Thornwell because I'm, I'm pushing this. I'm sorry. Thornwell, Gerardo, probably his most noted successor, without a doubt. Uh, without getting into biographical things, I'll just simply say I'll talk more about that tomorrow and his pastoral ministry. I'm actually going to use him pretty much as a paradigm for tomorrow's lecture to kind of talk, flesh out this the pastoral qualities of the Southern Presbyterians because he epitomizes that in his own life and work. But let me talk to you about, uh, about him and his theology. Uh, he wrote a number of books. Uh, some were not published until his death. And the reason is, is because two of them uh, gained him so much flack uh, from the public and from within his own church that he determined he didn't, he just could not stand up to that, that it was too much, too much. And so he ceased publishing. The first was his book on instrumental music. He was, a, he was Calvin on this. There was not to be the use of instrumental music in the corporate worship of God's people. And he published his little book, and it immediately became a lightning rod from within the southern church. Organs were already being introduced for the first time. And uh, even his old pastor, Thomas Smythe, had one in his home and brought one into the church in Charleston, uh, Columbia First Presbyterian Church had introduced one. He accepted a preaching engagement uh, at the First Presbyterian Church. They wanted to be the pastor while he was teaching there after the 1875. When he goes there, I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. And he said, no, I can't be pastor because of the great white idol you have in here. He finally capitulated and said, I, I will serve as an interim for you until you can find a pastor. But he wrote a letter saying, but it has to be publicly acknowledged that this is not in any way offering my support to the organ that's in your midst. And uh, so he caught some flack and that was tough. But none like he caught when he published The Will and Its Theological Relations. The Will and Its Theological Relations was a critique of Jonathan Edwards' philosophical necessitarianism. Dabney had already kind of poked on a sore here in his systematic notes. Archibald Alexander at Princeton had already picked on this thread a little bit in his moral philosophy. And Gerardo now when he found that Dr. Thornwell was in full agreement with him on this, that gave him the go-ahead after 25 years of study to write the book. And this deals with, so it's clear, this only deals with Adam in his pre-lapsarian state, in his pre-fall period. The necessitarian position is that Adam uh, was necess necessarily sinned. Thornwell's position was one much akin to William Cunningham, the Scotsman. Uh, it's, it's referred to now as a libertarian view, philosophical libertarianism. And that is that because the covenant of works was a, 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 a legitimate offer, do this and live upon the condition of perfect obedience. These, these men, this man and this woman, who have original righteousness, who have true knowledge, who have holiness, uh, if they keep the covenant of works, 
then all of these blessings will follow. And so he, he believed that, uh, that Edwards had overstated the case. He also understood Thomas Chalmers to hold the same position as Edwards. He, was not, he wasn't addressing Chalmers because he felt like Edwards was the, the main theological uh, figure here. And, of course, any time you poke on Jonathan Edwards, there's always going to be a, 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 a large number of people who don't take kindly to that. Now, I've got to tell you, though, in the 19th century, that was not quite as true as it is now. As I said, Archibald Alexander had already been undercutting Edwards in his moral philosophy book. Dabney had also in his uh, popular uh, writing on philosophy, uh, not the sensualistic philosophy, but the other uh, little book, the practical philosophy volume. And now, and Hodge also had drawn some, some of Edward's positions into question. We'll talk about those in a moment. And so that's his position. Cunningham said, sure, we can argue philosophically for a necessitarian position on Adam sinning. But we as churchmen should be more concerned with the theological argument and the biblical data. And from a, from a theological perspective, I do not think you can argue a, philosoph a philosophical necessitarianism. One of the leading scholars on this right now is, is Oliver Twist out at Fuller Seminary, who's written quite a bit on the Trinity uh, and, and also on this whole issue of, uh, of the will in its pre-fall state. Now, post-fall, Edwards and Gerardo are in lockstep. After the fall, you can only sin. But it's that question of before the fall that was brought forth here. Um, two other areas that I want to comment on Gerardo. Uh, one has to do with the federal theology. Gerardo uh, held the position that men had held before him, John Brown of Haddington, Thomas Boston uh, on, on this as well, John Dick, a very prominent Scottish theologian of the 19th century held this view too, and it's this, is that there is no distinction between the covenant of redemption and covenant of grace. That there is not an eternal covenant distinct from a covenant of grace in, in time and space. That it's one and the same. And that this eternal covenant flows into time and space. This is what Gerardo said, it's one and the same covenant, which regarded in relation to the means employed and the end contemplated is denominated the covenant of redemption, that is, emphatically designated the covenant of grace when conceived in reference to its source and to its unmerited application to sinners as the recipients of its benefits. It's peculiarly a covenant of grace to them since its legal condition was fulfilled not by themselves but by another for them guilty and corrupt. Uh, the larger catechism of Westminster says, with whom was the covenant of grace made? The covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam, and in him with all the elect as his seed. And from that, Gerardo understood and believed Calvin taught this as well, that there is this one covenant from eternity. God the Father, with God the Son, and in Christ, the elect. One of their great concerns, if you read John Dick, Thomas Boston, is that if you bifurcate these, it opens the door for an, for a, an Arminian twist on things because if you've got God the Father and God the Son having this eternal covenant, there has to be someone they have a covenant for and about. Who is it? Well, it's the elect. Ephesians 1 says so that we were chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. And so if you, if, you, if you separate Christ and the elect, and then you say the covenant of grace is with God and the elect in time and space, you're making, a, a, you're making an unnecessary and, in their opinion, a dangerous uh, bifurcation 
and separating Christ and the elect, and the Father and the elect, uh, and that coming together in Christ Jesus. It's, uh, it's another one of those intramural debates among Reformed men, but uh, Gerardo argues, I think, very uh, succinctly, but very ably to keep those as one. Even Turretin, after he gives a lengthy argument for maintaining the distinction, comes to the conclusion, but at the end it's superfluous. Gerardo pulls that on him and says, well, if it's superfluous, then what's the point? And, uh, and so, not enough time to go further, but there that is. Gerardo also did quite a bit with ecclesiology. He wrote 200 pages of journal articles on the office of deacon. The office of deacon was almost a lost office in the 19th century across uh, uh, traditions, in the Reformed traditions. And uh, it started a, a rebound with Thomas Chalmers in Scotland and then here in the States, and Gerardo was one of the leading figures in bringing the office of deacon back to its proper place. And he understood it this way, that the elder and the deacons should not be understood in a hierarchical relationship, but in a complementary relationship. That in the offices of elder and deacons, you see the gospel placarded to the church and working in the church. The office of elder caring for the spiritual needs of the church, the soulish needs, and the office of deacon caring for the bodily needs. And so in one, you've got Christ's work and caring for the, the sin problem, and in the deacon, you see them working on, for the body, the care of the temporal needs, and there we have the resurrection put before the church, that God, God cares. He not only saves us in our souls, but he saves our bodies, and we're looking forward to the ultimate, the resurrection of our bodies. John Gerardo on the office of deacon. Finally, adoption. And I'll tell you what, I'm at the hour mark and I realize that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this point, then I'm going to do a quick summary of Dabney. And then I'll be done. Doctrine of adoption. Gerardo picked this little thread out of Thornwell's writings, volume one of Thornwell's writings, and then developed it. Here's the beauty of this. One of the beauties of the way Gerardo did it. He became entranced with this doctrine of adoption. Sadly, uh, we don't have any of the sermons he preached. But we do know he preached sermons to the slaves in Charleston on the doctrine of adoption. Now you ponder that. What that must have meant to those dear, sweet souls in Charleston, to be enslaved on the one hand, but to understand their standing before God as a son, an adopted son. Gerardo took a position of Thomas Crawford that Thomas Crawford had taken in Scotland. In Scotland, there was this great theological squabble that went on between Thomas Crawford, who had stayed in the Church of Scotland, but was an orthodox, very sound confessional minister and, and, and professor, at the Free Church, or at the at the uh, at Edinburgh, and Robert Smith Candlish, who was the Free Church man who had followed with Cunningham and and Chalmers into the Free Church in 1843. Crawford said that Adam was created and bestowed with the qualities both of servant and son. We're told in the genealogies in Luke that that Adam was a son of God. And so that was the conclusion. He was in his defectable state, defectable just righteousness, defectable sonship, and so when he fell, that was gone. What we regain in redemption is a indefectible justification, and an indefectible adoption. Candlish came along and said, no. We were, but Adam was only a slave. He was, he was created a slave to God, not a son. He would have gained sonship had he kept the covenant. They exchange, you can go, you may have them here in your holdings, I don't know. There is a series, Candlish published first, 
against Crawford's, no, Canlet, Crawford published first, then Canlish published, and then Crawford published with an addendum or an appendix against Canlish's response. And then Canlish replied to Crawford's. There's four or five iterations of this where they go back and forth, and they just keep adding appendices in their revisions. It's a pretty interesting exchange that took place, and it's under the title The Fatherhood of God, but this adoption issue gets drawn into it, of course. Gerardo took Crawford's position, and uh, that was also in keeping with Thomas uh, Boston's position in his writings, in his commentary on the Shorter Catechism at the end of Volume 1. So, for Gerardo, Adam was made simul service at Phileas. In the recreation, regeneration, we then are simul service at Phileas. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? That when you get to the new heavens and new earth in Revelation, we're obviously we're sons. Adoption is all through the New Testament. But we're referred to in the new heavens and new earth setting as servants of God. That's something we will always be in, in that tandem. We are sons, yes, with all the privileges, but we are servants as well. We never lose that. Dabney, very quickly, y'all. See, I've got by all that time without saying y'all, but I just did it. Dabney. Uh, Dabney was a critic of Edwards. He thought Edwards gave man too much ability in that moral that distinction he made on ability. That we had natural ability, but not moral ability. And Dabney thought that was a problem that led to the positive sco positivist school of the 19th century. Archibald Alexander at Princeton agreed with him. He also believed that that's what fed revivalism and the whole revival movement, including although Edwards was contemporaneous with Whitfield, Dabney and the Southerners were not Whitfield fans. They were certainly not Charles Finney fans. Now, they understood the difference. Whitfield had a Calvinistic soteriology at work. Finney had a Pelagian soteriology at work, if you can call it that. But nevertheless, in their methodology, they had the same humanistic methodology at work. And Dabney thought that was certainly in the next generation after the first awakening that that was an Edwards contribution, an Edwards problem. I could go on and on. Immediate imputation, immediate imputation. Both Hodges, Charles and A.A., along with Dabney, were opposed to Edwards' doctrine of atonement. They did not believe it was uh, confessional. And I realize people quote this often, but Edward said he didn't find anything that he was out of accord with concerning Westminster Confession. Well, he may have well said that, but he was well out of line with several things, unless he had changed his mind by that point. That's one of those problems in chronology, in, in doing history, you know. But nevertheless, on that point at least, he's out of line with Westminster. He held to the immediate imputation of Adam's guilt and corruption, that we are condemned with Adam only immediately through natural generation, not immediately. A notable point where Dabney followed Charles Hodge and Turretin is on the adoption issue, as I've already mentioned. He saw it as, as being both a pardon and an adoption, justification, that is. So it was not distinct from justification. Uh, he held, he was prone to being agnostic on how Adam's sin was communicated to his progeny, for instance, is one of those. You'll find that in his systematic notes, also in his discussions, where he goes at length to deal with Charles Hodge's Romans 5 commentary. And he takes issue with Hodge. There's a fine little book by George Hutchinson, uh, was published uh, Originally in 1972, it's currently in print. Uh, 
uh, available again. It's called The Problem of Original Sin in American Presbyterian Theology. And there Hutchinson works through the Princeton School, through the Westminster School, John Murray, and the, uh, the New School position of, uh, of uh, Union Seminary in New York, but then also what B.B. Warfield termed the agnostic position, and that's Dabney. And the agnostic position is pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? When it came to the how was Adam's sin communicated to his progeny, Dabney said, I don't know, and I don't think the Bible says. And he argues both all the points and says none of these, none of these I think, are, are consistent and, and conclusive. So corruption, guilt, yes, yeah. How? Don't know. It just did. He's also agnostic on the point of the origin of souls. He gives it some discussion, and he talks about the Traducian, he talks about the creationist, and then he says, I don't, think, I don't think either one get it. I don't know what it is. I don't think we know exactly how the souls originate. It just is. And it is in such a way that man's responsible and God's not. But God did it. Thornwell, interestingly, goes into greater length on this and comes to virtually the same position that I just am not, with the light that I have on this topic from Scripture, I'm not, I don't have a conclusive answer to this. But we know the soul is originated not pre-existently. Everybody was against that one. They had so many problems with the creationist position, with the traducian position, that they just concluded, don't think this is, this is one of those areas where God has some secret here that we just don't fathom. Let me give you one, what I think is one of his great contributions. I wrote a piece in the Confessional Presbyterian a couple of years ago on this very thing and doctrine of sanctification and the use of the law in American Presbyterian tradition. And I, I compare a few, but I deal with Dabney particularly. Dabney was a staunch lover and supporter of the, doc, of the law of God, the moral law of God. He believed Jesus Christ when Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'm going to summarize. I know this is not a good way to do it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to summarize uh, what, he, what he says by quoting James Henley Thornwell. How's that? That way I get two in. And this is, uh, this is really good. You'll find this in Thornwell's Collected Writings, Volume 2, pages 383 and 385. And just uh, listen to this. This is glorious, actually. Those who deny that the law of God is the measure of duty or that personal holiness should be sought by Christians are those alone who can properly be charged with antinomian principles. The natural vibration of the mind is from the extreme legalism to that of licentiousness, and nothing but the grace of God can fix it in the proper medium of divine truth. You get the imagery. The gospel, like its blessed master, is always crucified between two thieves, Legalist of all sorts on the one hand and antinomians on the other. The former, the legalist, robbing the Savior of the glory of his work for us. And the other, antinomians, robbing him of the glory of his work within us. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's James Henley Thornwell, but that's also Robert Louis Dabney. That was a consensus position among Southern theologians. Uh, on this thing of the law and its relevance, its utility for the Christian. Uh, that's not legalism. You know, y'all, I'm sure, face this too. We do in our, in our tradition. You know, if, if you preach, if, if, if you preach the law, you're a legalist. And when I say to people, what does it mean to be a legalist? 
very often devolves into, well, if you, you know, if, if you think we, we're supposed to keep the law, if we're supposed to follow the law, if we're supposed to have the law as a rule of life, I say, no, technically that's not legalism. Legalism is if, you, if you're justified because of your keeping of the law. But the law has to do with our sanctification. The third use of the law. We've lost the third use of the law in so many quarters of our churches today. But I'll tell you another area. This is just an aside, and this is free, by the way. The first use. <clears throat> I've heard more times than I can count in the past three years that I want to start with people. I want to talk to them about Jesus. I don't want to get, I don't want to bring their sin and law into this mix because I won't, I won't be able to talk to them about grace then. And I quote an old Baptist preacher that I heard once say this, you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. Now that's bad theology. I know that's bad grammar. You can't get them lost, they're already born that way. And you can't get them saved, God has to do that. I understand, but the point's well taken. And God gave us the law to show us our sins. Paul said, I wouldn't have known that I coveted had not been for the law. If you don't know you're a sinner, you don't know you need a Savior. And the reason some of our people in our churches don't love the Savior like they ought to love the Savior is because they don't hate sin like they ought to hate sin, and that's because the law is not properly preached. Hand in hand with the, God, the grace, with the grace always. Well, I've, I've taxed you, and I've, I've, I may not be invited back tomorrow, but <laughs> I've had my say. Tomorrow is shorter by, 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 by deliberate, uh, but doing my little biographical sketch at the beginning cost me, and I'm sorry about that. Please forgive me. Any any questions? I can't. James Henley Thornwell, Collected Writings, Volume Two, pages three eighty five and or three eighty three and following. Volume two. Yeah, three eighty three and following. Goes through. I, those are two different. Uh, that that whole antinomian. If you want to just read the whole antinomian piece, it's in there. It's, that's what it's in that context of Thornwell's critique of antinomianism. Anyone else? You spoke of um, Pierre Doe being in favor of the of Boston's by covenantism. Was that a standard position in the Southern Presbyterian to sort of lean towards Boston rather than people perhaps like David Dixon? <coughs> Um, no, it's a good question. Dabney maintained the covenant of redemption, covenant of grace distinction. So if you want to put the two, at the time they would have been the two leading theologians. After Thornwell died in 1862, at the age of 49, <clears throat> Gerardo then came on the scene 13 years later in the interim was a man named William Plummer. Some of you may have read some of Plummer's works, The Rock of Salvation, Jehovah Jireh. He wrote a number of very devotional theological treatises. And, uh, <clears throat> but then uh, something changed in 1874-75, and that is that because of political pressure, the northern government, as well as societal issues, uh, segregation was forced upon churches uh, that had not been true before in the South. Blacks and whites had worshipped together in the North uh, and the South. But because of the Freedmen's Bureau and some of the governmental forces at the time, they were forced to, forced to separate. With that, Gerardo uh, was no longer then the pastor of this large congregation of, of free and slave blacks as well as white membership. And that's when they took the opportunity to, <clears throat> they, it got rather political because Plummer had been there several years now and he'd filled a void for them when they needed it filled from Thornwell's death. And what they did is they created a new 
position. You know, we don't often like to just fire somebody. We just create a new position. So they created uh, a professor of, of practical theology at the Columbia Seminary. And they bestowed that title upon the beloved Dr. Plummer. Well, he didn't like it. He knew what they were doing. They were moving him out for their son, Gerardo, their favorite. And they then called Gerardo to be the new professor to succeed. And it was said this way, to succeed Dr. Thornwell. Well, poor Plummer had been there in the interim, but they didn't really count him as a successor to Thornwell. But that's a whole other issue. Uh, Thornwell, when Gerardo goes to teaching, uh, he leaves that congregation in Charleston and takes up teaching in uh, Columbia. And uh, that's when he begins his academic work. Uh, for you know, in a legitimate uh, 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 way. And at that point, then he and he and Dabney are the two theologians in the South of of note, and they're the ones who are recognized because they hold chairs at the two seminaries in the South. And so he and Dabney would have been at odds on this. So no, there's not a consensus position on it. That's a long way to answer your question, but I wanted to put it in setting. Sometimes knowing a lot gets in the way of saying a little, you know? Anyone else? All right, well, you've been gracious. Thanks for tolerating me. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.